Welcome to All About the Grace. I am Bridget Ayer and I am hosting this new YouTube show with um, my guest today is Stephen O'Keefe and he is a local apologist and um, Catholic guy. Catholic guy. Catholic guy. Yep. The, you're the question guy. You need like a, you need like a, um, a superhero costume. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you're, you're, I think that as an apologist you can maybe start to think too highly of yourself. You should probably just think of yourself as, you know, you've got, you know, the beneath the guy who cleans out the toilets and does the trash is the apologist who who sits there just answering questions and, you know. Well, it's a hard it's a hard thing to do, but for those who may not know what an apologist is, will you explain what that actually means and then sure. maybe what a Catholic apologist is? Yeah, so And and then how you got to do this? So um, so a, a Catholic apologist, which, which you are. So a Catholic apologist is someone who uh, applies the art of, of knowing the faith and finding creative ways to explain it to other people and to present the best case possible for the Catholic faith. Now this doesn't always mean, as we were talking about before, making the most convenient case. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to go out there and say, you know, all is well and, you know, everything is bright and sunny in the Catholic Church and that there's nothing uh, that, that we're that perfect could go wrong. and there's no problem. Yeah, you, you, you want to make an honest case. You want to make a good and honest case. Um, can I give it for instance? Sure, go ahead. Okay, it is often. I'm going to use my fun gadget that I just got at Hobby Lobby. That's, that's you don't have to answer in that amount of time, but I'm just curious how long your answers are. We'll see. It's okay. Um, so, for instance, you're the answer as, guy. As as Catholics, or actually even just as Christians broadly, we've probably all heard that all of the apostles died a martyr's death. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Yeah, I have. How do you know that? I don't know how I know that. Yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> if you're and so if you're so what does that mean that means that if you're trying to con if you're trying to talk to a person about the the truthfulness of the apostles right mm -hmm. and the veracity of their story and you say all of the apostles died a martyr's death and then the person you're talking to the skeptic says how do you know that you're going to look foolish because you don't know how did. you know that <laughs> i don't right? know how i know well that happened to me right okay and i think john lived though john didn't john didn't get because he was at the foot of the cross but i don't know how i know that either um well it's implied and i mean it all depends on who you think the beloved apostle was in john's gospel which is a conversation for another time okay um so anyways uh so you know the, the the most convenient case possible, you know the best foot forward would be to say, yeah, all the apostles died a martyr's death. Okay. But then imagine a, you convince a person of that, and they go out with that assumption, and then someone challenges them. Well, what you've done is you, you've set someone up for failure. Gotcha. And so what you really want to do is say, okay, what's the best case I have? You know, what does the what can the evidence actually support? Who, which of these guys really did die a martyr's death? And you get. Uh, Paul and Peter and James uh, and maybe one other that we can kind of verify uh, died a martyr's death. All from and scripture, right? Not all. Well, some from, from scripture. Scri some from scripture. Some from early church historians. Okay. Um, like Josephus or Ignatius of Antioch. Um, uh, they talk about the martyrdom of Peter and Paul and James, and uh, and so from there you can make a more limited case, a more humble case which still proves the same thing, mm -hmm. but now you've done it in a way which is actually supportable with evidence. And so, you know, a, an entry-level apologist, you, you might, might know the bit about all the apostles dying a martyr's death, mm -hmm. you know, fly the flag and, and, uh, and say the, the party line. But then as you get to, as you go around the block a few more times, you realize, no, I need to pull that back a little bit and give a realistic case as opposed to one that just sounds the best. Okay, so let, let's start with how you got into doing this. You've been doing this now for what, nine nine years now? About? Thereabouts, yeah. Okay. So. And you, you yeah. grew up, okay, let's go, go back a little further. Even further. Let's go back further. Um, you grew up Catholic, mm -hmm. but you, you kind of described that your upbringing was kind of, you were kind of a marginal Catholic. Can you describe yeah. that? And then how did you get... So, Why are you Catholic? Why did you kind of get into this? Well, so, okay. So, Other than baptism. Yeah, so I, I sometimes call it New England Catholic. Okay. Because out there, it's just sort of, 
it's in it's in the the milieu it's in the culture you know your 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 his your family is historically catholic right mm -hmm. um and uh, but if you want to take it very seriously you know they say that's for weird people that's, mm. that's that's for weird people okay all right you, you you're wicked weird okay. if you if you think this is something you got to do like, all right actually believe in stuff there mm -hmm. as, I, as i turn on my new england accent very good um so that's kind of the milieu in which i was raised so it's my parents um they uh they took me to church god bless them they put me through all the sacraments uh and i and i owe a lot to them for that um but the way that they were raised was that your religion is sort of on the level of a hobby. That's sort of how how they were inculcated, and that's sort of what they and, and you, that's sort of what was passed on to me. Sure. Um, you know, it wasn't passed on to me that this is a rigorous pursuit of truth which you need to apply to every day of your life type deal, mm -hmm. um, because that's just not the way that their generation was raised. Right. Um, so, but I, I always had an interest in these very important you know greatest topics of you know god and all of these all these great questions and throughout middle school most of what i had in my head was just uh things i pieced together from here and there i was like a scrap collector for christian stuff and you know i was like okay i got the rapture over here that i pulled over from evangelical land and maybe a couple bible verses i've heard i didn't even know that they were reading the bible at mass i didn't even know that was the bible wow um i just thought that was just boring stuff that they read i didn't even know what it all meant at all um and that began to change in senior year when i attended a bible study mm -hmm. um and I'll, okay since we're on youtube i'm going to now admit something i didn't say on the radio program which okay was, um i was walking down the hallway with a friend of mine and this gorgeous girl walks up to my friend and says are you going to bible study tonight and he says, uh, yeah, yeah, it's at this person's house, I'll see you there. And I was like, where is this Bible study? <laughs> There's good and, looking girls! And, and are there more of these there? <laughs> uh, and so that's how I, that's how I started going. Hey, to, God will get you however, yeah, right? God is not, is not picky in that way. He'll, he'll use, I mean, and I'm pretty simple, I suppose. Um, and so, um, and so I went to the Bible study and there I encountered uh, a fellow who we both are fond of is Deacon Paul Lunsford, who was just made of dynamite. And he and he knew his faith, and he wanted you to know it. And that was really my first foot into the world of apologetics, was hearing him explain the faith to teenagers. And I think what's really great about, um, and now you lead this, I'm just going to mm -hmm. kind of jump ahead. You lead this, um, <laughs> we fast forwarded like, what, 10 years yeah, or something like that? Yeah, about a decade, you lead this uh, Bible study, which is really kind of, I've been there um, and it's its very unconventional, not since you've done it, but I've been there and it's, mm -hmm. it's very unconventional in the sense that people just start kind of asking questions, right? Yeah. Is that kind of how, tell us about yeah. the format because it's... it's So fast it's, forward 10 years later, there's some more formation in, in college and then and then I come out of college and I run into Deacon Paul once for again. He asked me to volunteer at the uh, at the Bible study, and then he gives it to me when he when he retires from youth ministry. There's the long story short version. So, what I do is we start off in the first you know half hour or more is dedicated to just who's got something you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what it is. I mean, as long as it's somewhat related to the Catholic faith, and I mean somewhat. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, <laughs> it's a stretch sometimes, yeah. right? I mean, we've had some, Like my cat died. Yeah. Right? I mean, it could be as... You can, yeah, you can you can branch into the Catholic faith for, in a dozen ways, you know, talking about, like, what is the fate of animals and what's their status. I mean, you can, yeah, all kinds of things you can talk about there. We've talked about science fiction stories and um, just anything a person wants to talk about, for, you know, high schoolers need that sort of outlet, right? They need to know that there's someone listening and, interest, and is interested in what they have to say. And uh, if they have a question, they want to hear a good answer for it. Uh, and so that's what the first half hour of it is really devoted to, is I'm, I'm basically turning these kids upside down and shaking them out. <laughs> like, all right, all right. What do you got in your pockets yeah, here? You got some who, questions? Who's, who's got questions? And sometimes it's frustrating because it's like they don't, Many times we don't know the questions we have until we get challenged on a thing, mm -hmm. and that's and that's what, that's probably my biggest enemy at the Bible study is the kids not knowing what they don't know. And so sometimes I will have to ask them questions and say, "How would you answer someone who says this?" And then they all stare at me blankly, and it's like, "You didn't know you you didn't know you didn't know that, did you?" Um, and so then we'll talk about that. So that's really that's the goal of Acts is to have that outlet that prevents a person from later on saying, 
I left the I left religion because you know there was no intellectual curiosity. There was there was no tolerance for asking questions. I'm there to be the guy who takes away your right to say that. You know, if someone leaves my program and says no one would listen to my questions, and it's like, well, what were you doing? Were you just eating M and M's the whole time? Because it's like, <laughs> you have M and M's there, right? <laughs> There's usually M and M's. I mean, you have teenagers, so you gotta feed them. So I have some other questions I would like to ask you since you're the question guy. Okay. Um, why? You can't really talk when people kind of refute they have concerns or questions about the Catholic Church, you kind of have to go back and you have to kind of start out with authority. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you can't really, it's, it's, I think, I feel like it's difficult to have a conversation. So what yeah. exactly, why should we be Catholic? Yeah. Did Jesus set up the Catholic Church and what kind of evidence is there for that? Why are we yeah. Catholic? Because there's all sorts of shenanigans that have, have gone on for time and memorial, mm -hmm. and yet people are still Catholic. It's not that we're stupid, right? We're not stupid. Many of us are. Well, that's true. <laughs> okay, but for those of us who know why we're there, why are we there? Oh, by the way, and I'm I'm one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can do that too. It depends on what you ask me. I have to look it up. Precisely. But um, do you understand my question? Yeah. So, look, if you're if you're talking to a person about biblical interpretation say you're talking to another christian right? yes yeah. and you're in and, and you're trying to figure out uh how baptism is to be performed from the bible mm -hmm. i could come up with a good case that baptism is only to be done with immersion you know full dunking underwater mm -hmm. uh, another case could be brought up saying no no i think that the text points to saying that it's okay to pour water over someone's head okay now you could argue it all day mm -hmm. but in the end what you're left with is two opinions about what the text means and then both of you have to go your separate ways and uh and that's that's a system that doesn't work okay um so you well, right because i mean you could say we have forty thousand forty thousand different christian denominations because of that yeah. very kind of scenario where can i can i aggravate you for just a moment go ahead aggravate me okay so remember how i Here. said <laughs> No, go ahead. Just, I'm just teasing you. Okay, so remember how I said that, like you don't want to say that all the apostles died for their faith because you're bound to have a person ask, how do you know that? Uh-huh. Right, so the 40,000 denominations thing, mm -hmm. that's another thing that be, that really invites people to say, how do you know that? You know, Actually, I did see a Pew Research Institute on that, it's, and, and it, it's probably lower than that. It it's is probably my, lower yeah. than that. I always Because you can kind of group. Yeah, you can group. So they actually count the different rites in the Catholic Church. And as there's what, 30 and there's 30 yeah right? hundreds is a much like because sometimes you'll see catholic apologists trot out the forty thousand number mm -hmm. and then protestant apologists will jump down their throat and say it's not forty thousand. it's fine it's hundreds i mean <laughs> right yeah i know it's like, what's the difference you know? you know i mean is there really a difference yeah if i'm trying to you prove still have that, the same problem yeah if i'm trying to prove that like you have too many dogs i don't need to say that you have forty thousand dogs a hundred dogs will do <laughs> Okay. I'd like a hundred dogs. <laughs> my husband I'm, would. My husband would not like a hundred dogs. There are people who have a thousand or who have a hundred cats, and uh, they have the but, strange cat lady, yeah, right? But anyway, so uh, so back to the topic of why we why is the church what it is, and it's because it's just demonstrably, I wouldn't say obvious, but it kind of is when you think about it. That if you're going to have this book, you have to explain where the book came from, who decides what went in the book. And, uh, and how do you rightly interpret the book? And all that points back to the fact that Jesus established a community which had leadership. Okay, so it had the original 12 apostles and then they laid hands on men uh, to be the next generation of leaders and on and on and on and on it went. And, uh, and can you trace that line of succession, that line of hands-on laying off hands, can you trace that down through history? And the answer is you can. Mm -hmm. And that's called apostolic succession, and that's something that people often find when they study church history, is they realize, oh, all of church history up until the 1500s took that really seriously. Mm -hmm. they, they thought it was just a really key thing to the Christian faith to have that continuity of the laying on of hands, and that that is, that is what enables us to have a firm basis upon which we make a rational act of faith. Mm -hmm. That we can say, 
here's this body of tradition which has really demonstrably been proven to be, uh, to be passed down since the year 33 AD. And that is, in, in essence, this, the star of the Catholic Church, is way back then, you know, the first bishops, the apostles, step out of the upper room and off to the races. And the short answer of that, which is not as well thought out as, as, as Stephen's, which I appreciate that because that is a very good answer, but I just say it's because Jesus set it up that way. Yeah. And, you know, that was kind of, you know, that was the plan, and so if we really love Jesus, we're just trying to follow the plan. Now, the other question I want to delve into a little bit is um, when you talk about, I always try to make this analogy when people talk about scandals, mm -hmm. that if... Um, if a pastor of a, of a non-Catholic church, let's say they stole money or they mm -hmm. had an affair, they did something immoral, okay, yeah. would that render the Bible invalid? Would that yeah. make it um, not the Word of God? No, well, the just, people would say, of course not, no, right? Just means they're not living up to it, are they? Correct. So, but there's a, a little bit of a different... Um, I guess that there's a similar analogy you can make, but when you talk about if there's impropriety in church leadership mm -hmm. and people who are not Catholic who don't really understand that Jesus set it up this way, how do you kind of defend that when there, when there are scandals or have been scandals throughout the history of the church? Um, how do you address scandals and kind of come back to apostolic succession yeah and it doesn't it doesn't invalidate what you just said yeah and I guess you could do you know what I'm saying yeah there's all kinds of analogies you could make you could say like look here are ten corrupt congressmen mm -hmm. do we abolish Congress was Congress a bad idea you know do we abolish the United States because we have these you know these corrupt senators or something or even a president who's gone off the rails or something um, what you have to show is there's a distinction between the the covenant community that Jesus set up and the fact that people within that community are going to behave very poorly starting with me right mm -hmm. you know it's easy to say look at these other sinners right? right and it's easy to say that especially when their sins are so great of course the thing in the news right now is of course the Philadelphia report about the uh, the abuse scandal and all the rest of it and, and things that would just make your jaw drop when you read it um, it's it's easy to think to yourself, I am just a completely different sort of being than these abusers. Right. Um, and we're not. But the thing we is, all, we're not. We're all, we all, you know, get the plank out of our yeah. own eye before we get right. the speck out of somebody else's eye. And, and so it calls for a little bit of humility to say, okay, you know, there there ain't no pure church. I'm, I'm one more person who's, you know, just going along and trying not to screw up too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I'm okay with me being in a sinner in the church, and I recognize that my presence doesn't invalidate the church, you know, I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to see that my sinfulness doesn't mean that the Catholic Church is invalid. Okay, now i got to apply it to these people. And it's more difficult because they're in the leadership. Right. right? It's more difficult. Uh, but it really is the same the same prospect. You know, I've I've heard it said. Um, there's a blogger named Mark Shea who. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to Mark and, is. And, and he's and he said once that you know if you go by the apostles, by the record of the apostles, we fully expect one twelfth of our bishops to sell out the Son of God, <laughs> and, the, and the rest to flee. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like so it's like we're you know right off. That's the a bat, great that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. You know? and we we shouldn't. You know, if, if we're looking at our at our leadership and saying, you know, it, it, we sh we should say to them we have high expectations of you. Right. But in the back of our minds, we should be saying we have low expectations for you. Um, you know, we're, you don't join the church because it just has the most competent leaders possible. You recognize that, love it or hate it, this is the same community that Jesus set up, and eventually it's going to be Jesus who's going to come back and set things straight in the end. And uh, I think it was John Chrysostom who said, the road to hell is paved with the skulls of bishops. Mm -hmm. You know, he knew back then, back mm -hmm. in the year around the 300s, that, you know, failures in leadership were a real feature of the church. 
and it's just the way it's going to have to be until until Jesus comes again and uh, and you know does his end of the book of Revelation stuff. So the I guess the message of this is that just because leaders are sinful in the church does not invalidate Jesus' plan of salvation through the Catholic Church. Yeah, it's you know send those leaders to jail. You know it's we can get new ones. Right. The one thing that you can't get new of is, you know, you can't go back in time and then start another branch of apostolic succession, another uh, another line of uh, the successors of St. Peter. You know, one community Jesus founded, one church. And so you're, you're stuck in it even when it's scandalous, even when it's embarrassing. So um, I have a really bizarre question to ask you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Since you're used to fielding questions. I do my best. Okay, this is a simple one and I actually emailed it to you. Because okay. um, Stephen actually, for our uh, Catholic parish in here in Carmel, Indiana, he is the Acts apologist and people can email questions into the email and um, it's in the bulletin every week, which I think is a really great way for Catholic parishes to kind of um, have a Q&A because people always have questions so I just like that, that that our parish does that but why do we light a candle and say a prayer did you get that question have you yeah, read that yet yeah yeah I did I know it's I know but, it's a weird question but, but no, it's if not, you didn't know it's, yeah it's, I mean it's not a weird question because it's like you know if you're not used to people lighting can I mean as Catholics we're like all is well they're lighting a candle and then if you have a person who's who's practice of the Christian faith has never even seen it you know what are these candles for? Then, um, as I do my Jerry Seinfeld impression, <laughs> what's the deal with all the candles? <laughs> I um, didn't know. I didn't know you were doing impressions. You've done two impressions already, so. We're... So um, I don't. Uh, I don't have. There's, I got there's no. There's no long answer for this. It's just that candles represent prayers. That's it. That's it. The candle is sort of a visual representation of the prayer. I mean, and the thing is, though, you don't have to be Catholic to understand that. Right. Because I mean, I suppose this is going to take this to a dark place. <laughs> but after 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 a shooting, after some mm -hmm. of those mass massacres that we have in America, mm -hmm. uh, what happens? Well, people will build sort of a shrine at the site of the shooting, yep. and they'll have pictures of the people who died, and then they'll have candles. Right. And it's like, well, this is kind of a normal human thing is that we recognize that there's something about a little light that's supposed to represent our desires for this person, and. Yeah, you know, that's what a that's what the candle is, and uh, there's not much more more than that. It's just a little visual symbol.